Five days ago, we marked the day when the Buddha gave his first sermon, setting the wheel of Dharma in motion. He explained the Four Noble Truths, the duties appropriate for each of those truths. And one of his listeners in the Five Brethren, Gondanya, gained the Dharma eye. Becoming the first noble disciple in the Buddhist teachings, and also the first member of the Sangha, the conventional Sangha, asking for ordination after the end of the sermon. The story doesn't end there. It goes on to say that over the next few days, the Buddha taught the remaining members of the Five Brethren to gain the Dharma eye as well. <coughs> And at some point, then, he gave the second sermon, the sermon we chanted just now, which the commentary has named the not-self characteristic. In the canon, it's simply called Five Bancha, either referring to the Five Brethren or to the Five Aggregates. In the tradition in Thailand, it was, it was on the fifth day after the first sermon, so that would be tonight. This was the sermon that led all five of the brethren to become arahants, to gain full awakening. It was on the theme, of course, of not-self. That should have learned us right there. Some people say that stream entry is the point where you see there is no self. But if that were the case, then why would the Buddha have given this sermon to the five brethren? They would have already seen there was no self, there was nothing more to say on the topic. But the fact is, there is more to say. Because with stream entry, they say, you let go of the fetter of self-identification. In other words, you don't say that I am any of the five aggregates. You don't say that I own any of the five aggregates, or that the five aggregates exist in me, or that I exist in the five aggregates. So that kind of identification with the five aggregates is gone. But there still is a lingering sense of I am. That's called conceit. And that fetter isn't cut until our hunship. And there's a sutta where a non-returner talks about what it's like. It's just a lingering sense of I am that lingers around the five aggregates. Just as when you wash a cloth, and there's still a scent of the detergent. So it's that lingering scent that the Buddha was trying to get rid of. He started out by pointing out that the five aggregates are not totally under your control. They can suffer dis-ease. There's dis-ease in the body, dis-ease in your feelings, in your perceptions, in your thought constructs, even in your consciousness. And if they really were you or yours, you could totally control them. Now, this doesn't mean there's no control at all. As the Buddha admitted in other places, the aggregates do have some pleasure that they offer us. If they didn't have any pleasure at all, we wouldn't be attached to them. And they do respond to some extent to our control, which is why we're able to take them and turn them into the path. But ultimately, no matter what you do with them, it's all going to fall apart, except for one thing. You make a path out of them. The path leads you to the deathless, and then when the aggregates fall apart, it doesn't matter, because you found the deathless. After pointing out that they don't lie totally under your control, the next step he gave him in a questionnaire. And this is a questionnaire that he was to give many, many times throughout his teaching career. 
starting with form. Is form constant or inconstant? We look at it and it's inconstant. If something is inconstant, is it easeful or stressful? The fact that it's inconstant and undependable means that it's stressful. It's like building a house in a place where there are earthquakes and landslides all the time. You know no peace. So if it's inconstant, stressful, subject to change, is it worth calling yourself? And the answer is no. Then you continue with the same questionnaire down through the remaining aggregates, feelings, perceptions, thought fabrications, consciousness. So that dealt with the aggregates in the present moment. And then he continued by saying you extrapolate from the present moment, you think back to the past. Those who are able to remember past lives, what are they remembering? They're remembering form, feeling, perceptions, fabrications, consciousness. And wherever you could go in the future, in the universe, even the most refined levels, the far distant levels, anywhere in space and time, just the same aggregates with the same characteristics. So you look at the present moment, you see that it's not worth latching onto, and then you extrapolate and you realize anything you could create out of these aggregates into the future is not worth latching onto. And this is where the five brethren abandon their clinging to the aggregates. That's how they gain full awakening. They basically develop dispassion. Dispassion is a word that we don't like to use a lot in the West. It sounds gray, dull, dead. But what it basically means is that you've outgrown your fascination with something. You're no longer intrigued by it, because you've seen that it's got its limitations. There are two ways you can do this. Think about tic-tac-toe. When you're a little child and you haven't thought through all the various ways that tic-tac-toe could be played, it's fascinating. You have fun playing it with your friends. But there comes a point when you realize there are only so many different ways you can play it. You start in a particular way, you're bound to lose. You start in another way, you're, at the very least you're going to come to a draw. And you lose your fascination because you've seen all of the potentials. They long, no longer hold any interest, they no longer capture imagination. Or another way you could get dispassionate is about chess. It would be very hard to think of all the possible ways of playing chess. And some people find it fascinating, they can spend their whole lives doing it. But if you look at the rules, you realize that this is all very artificial. And what's really accomplished by playing such an artificial game. So even though you don't know all the possibilities, you realize that whatever they are, They're not worth it. This was the kind of dispassion that the br five brethren developed, realizing you look at the aggregates and there's not much there. Now we can create all kinds of things out of the aggregates. Universes can go on and on and on for billions of years with all kinds of different configurations. And beings can take on all kinds of identities. As the Buddha once said, look at the animal world. All the different animals, from the little tiny ones to the huge whales. And back in those days they had stories of whale eaters and whale whale eaters. Enormous sea creatures. All of that comes from the mind, and it's all just five aggregates. 
but they can take all kinds of shapes, all kinds of identities. But it's still all very artificial. It's all going to come crashing down. And then you try to do it again, do it again, do it again. You think about that, cast your mind to the past about how many aeons you've been doing this, and into the future. How many more aeons do you want to do it? Now the five brethren had the advantage that they had actually experienced the deathless already. And they were looking at this in terms of the Four Noble Truths. So that questionnaire makes sense only in terms of the Four Noble Truths. If you believe that all there is in this world is the five aggregates, then you say, well, even though they have their limitations, this is what I've got, this is all there is, better hold on. But they'd already seen there was something else that was not encompassed by the five aggregates. There was the consciousness without surface, the deathless. And they realized that by letting go of the aggregates, they could fully realize that. So the minds were already inclined to see there was, must be something better. <clears throat> there must be some way out of this universe of limitations. And so the Buddhist Dharma talk was designed to help encourage that sense of dispassion, so that even whatever lingering sense of I am there was around the aggregates, that would be gone. Because the five aggregates lost their appeal. They no longer captured the imaginations of the five brethren. Our problem is that we still find them fascinating. For most of us, we haven't seen the deathless. So the range of our imagination is encompassed by these aggregates. And as we've seen, you can do all kinds of things with them. So you have to learn to realize they do have their limitations. And trust the Buddha when he says, if you can develop dispassion for these things, there's something a lot better. So we follow his strategy. We take these aggregates and we do the most useful thing we can with them, which is we make them a path. Right view, for instance, is made up of perceptions and thought fabrications. Right concentration is made up of all five aggregates. Do the best thing you can with the aggregates. And then you reflect on what you're doing. You push against those three perceptions, inconstancy, stress, not self. You try to make your concentration as constant as you can, as easeful as you can. Bring the mind as much under control as you can. And you learn to appreciate this state of concentration that can develop and the many levels it can go through. And that becomes your main attachment. But then when you begin to see, as your sensitivities get developed, that this too has its limitations. And keeping in mind the Buddha's third noble truth, you say, well, how about letting go of even this? That's the task that lies before us. The five brethren have shown the way. And as I said, the Buddha would give this questionnaire and with a follow-up reflection many, many times throughout the course of his teaching career. bringing many people to awakening. So trust the Buddha when he says that dispassion is the highest of all dharmas. Trust Sariputta when he told those monks, he wanted to introduce the Buddha's teachings to strangers in foreign countries. They ask you, what does the Buddha teach? Start out by saying he teaches the end of passion and desire. Passion and desire for what? For the five aggregates. 
What advantage is there in developing passion and desire? If you still have attachment to passion and desire for the five aggregates, then when they change, you're going to suffer. If you abandon that passion and desire, then no matter how much they change, you're not going to suffer. And as he said, he taught this because it's something that people can do, and they will benefit from it. They will find happiness. In fact, this theme of dispassion is so important that when his stepmother asked him for some basic principles of the Dharma to take in practice, he started out by saying, you know something is a teaching of the Dharma if it leads to dispassion. So trust the Buddha on that point. Learn to see the limitations of the five aggregates. You don't have to encompass all the possibilities, because you've been going through many possibilities. But just look at them right now. They show their limitations all the time right now. You try to develop a feeling of ease, and it'll last for a while, and then it'll change. You try to develop a perception of the breath that gives rise to concentration, and it'll last for a while, but then it'll change, and so on through the aggregates. Learn to keep looking at this again and again and again, until you finally decide that you had enough. And that state of enough is not a sort of a dead weariness. It comes with the realization that when you've had enough of these things, something much better opens up. So follow the path. Have trust in the path, and that's where it'll take you.